Good afternoon. Portfolio questions. Number one, Linda Fabiani, please. To ask the government what its response is to the UK government scrapping the EU settled status fee. Ben McPherson, Minister, please. Since the EU referendum in June 2016, the Scottish Government has been consistent in both our words and our actions. We want EU citizens to stay in Scotland. Therefore, Presiding Officer, I am pleased the Prime Minister has finally seen sense and listened to the deluge of calls to scrap the unfair settled status fee, including the call of this Parliament, with the exception of the Scottish Conservatives. However, dropping the fee does not change the fact that UK, the UK Government is still making EU citizens apply to retain their current rights. Therefore, to assist EU citizens in our communities in order to apply for settled status, the Scottish Government's advice service, delivered in partnership with Citizens Advice Scotland, will help ensure that EU citizens feel welcome, supported and valued. And what's more, the Prime Minister's approach to migration makes it all the more clear why it's time for this Parliament to have powers over immigration to determine a tailor-made policy. Linda Fabiani. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that answer? And may I advise the Minister um, of a constituent who has lived in Scotland for decades but who has not renew renewed his EU passport. Now he has to do so at a cost to prove to the UK Home Office that he is, in fact, an EU national. In order to do this, he has to prove to his EU nation that he is not a British citizen. This also at a cost by obtaining a confirmation of non-acquisition of British citizenship from the UK Home Office. Does the Minister agree that this anomalous situation is insulting and concerning to someone who has lived and worked here for more than 30 years, raised his family, has a national insurance number and has paid taxes? Surely this man and others like him, no doubt, already has a proven right to continue to live in and contribute to Scotland. It is, after all, his home. Minister. Thank Linda Fabiani for raising uh, her specific case. And I think it's, uh, I share the concerns about it uh, being a situation that is uh, insulting and uh, of, of, of concern. And I'm sympathetic to the many families and individuals that have difficulties navigating the complex and increasingly restrictive UK immigration rules as illustrated in the case raised by Linda Fabiani. It is right that EU citizens who have built their lives here and chosen to make Scotland their home should have all their rights protected. And if the UK government persists in its ambition to remove Scotland from the EU against the will of the Scottish people, then it is vital that those EU citizens who have chosen to make their home here in Scotland are provided with the documentation they need through as simple a process as possible in order to evidence their right to continue to live here as they do now. I would be happy to raise such cases, including the case raised by Linda Fabiani today with the UK Immigration Minister, with the consent of the individuals concerned. And I want to reassure all MSPs that we in the Scottish Government are pressing the UK Government for a fair and managed immigration system that recognises individual circumstances and provides a welcoming environment for new Scots and their families. Uh, thank you. Can I remind everyone, I mean everyone, short questions and crisp answers please would be very helpful. In other words, that's what I want. Question, uh, sorry, Neil Finlay. Uh, I welcome the scrapping of the, uh, the fee for EU residents. Will the Minister uh, join me and now calling for the UK government to take the next step and end their hostile, hostile environment policy and uh, their anti-immigration policies and rhetoric. Minister, please. Absolutely. Uh, I, I welcome the sentiment in, in Neil Finlay's question and, and wish we'd uh, seen such a coherent position from Labour in, in the House of Commons earlier this week on the UK immigration bill. I think uh, the, 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 the hostile environment policy from the UK government has been discredited in both practice and principle. And um, it should be noted that since June 2016, the UK government uh, should have provided assurances to EU citizens separate to any withdrawal agreement. And they could have done that in every month up until this point, and they didn't. And uh, th they should uh, think about that very carefully. Question two, David Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment is made of the impact of Brexit on the life sciences sector. Minister. The Scottish Government has engaged widely across the breadth of the life science sector and also commissioned Ernst & Young to undertake a sectoral impact analysis and Brexit readiness assessment. 
This assessment has been shared with the UK government as clear evidence of the negative impact Brexit will have across sectors in Scotland. It also accords with evidence from industry and unions which suggests Brexit will be damaging to the sector in terms of tariff and non-tariff barriers, supply chain resilience, legal and regulatory compliance, free movement of people, loss of EU funding and disinvestment from foreign investors. David, David Sue. Thank you, Mr. Officer. The Minister will be well aware that the Harlands and Islands have over 80 life sciences companies employing over 1,800 people. All these companies rely on academic talent from the other 27 nations in the EU. Does the Minister share my view that Brexit is a clear and present danger to the future viability of life sciences sector in the Highlands and Islands? Minister. I, I thank David Stewart for that question. I think he makes a very important point about the detriment of the removal of free movement as a whole uh, if, if indeed the UK is, is, uh, leaves the EU uh, and, and Brexit takes place. And uh, I would, in a constructive manner and in good faith, uh, encourage David Stewart and colleagues to continue to engage with us as the Scottish Government and work together to push for flexibility in the UK immigration system by way of a Scottish visa so that we can support key sectors in our economy, including the life sciences sector. Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Innovation in research and development is key to the success of the life sciences sector. As the Minister knows, a significant number of EU citizens work in R&D. What assistance, therefore, can the Scottish Government provide to ensure our competitiveness in R&D is not seriously compromised by Brexit? Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Kenneth Gibson, for that question. I think there are two, two aspects uh, in which we can all work together proactively in order to continue to support R&D in the life sciences sector and elsewhere in terms of the challenges faced by Brexit. One is to continue uh, to oppose the removal of free movement and to uh, oppose the restrictions that are being uh, set out in the UK government's white paper on immigration. And two, we should all collectively be working together to urge the UK government to continue UK participation in, as a third partner country in the event of Brexit in EU programmes like Horizon 2020 and indeed at the Joint Ministerial Council uh, on Europe in London on Monday. That's exactly what I pressed on behalf of Scotland. Question three, Alison Haddon. Thank you, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether the Minister for Parliamentary Business will provide an update regarding the lodging of the legislative consent motion for the Healthcare International Arrangements Bill. Minister Graham Day, please. Presiding officer, the legislative consent motion in question was lodged on Monday, the 14th of January. It was moved by the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport on Wednesday, the 16th of January, when it was agreed unanimously by the Parliament. Alison Harris. I thank the Minister for that answer. But surely finally giving consent after months of threats not to just shows up the Scottish Government's empty bluster and suggests that the right thing across all Brexit issues is to work consistently and dump the grandstanding. Minister. Wow. Uh, Presiding officer, the Scottish Government has shown itself through its approach to Brexit related legislation to be reasonable and pragmatic. But until and unless we can be assured that the decisions of the Parliament will be respected by the UK Government, we will not lodge legislative consent motions on Brexit-related provisions except in the most exceptional of circumstances. Um, we will continue to contribute fully to committee and parliamentary consideration and ensure that the Parliament is able to express its views on Brexit-related provisions in UK bills. But overarching all of this, Presiding Officer, is a simple truth. Our role as the Scottish Government is to stand up for the interest of Scotland, something the Conservatives might want to try sometime. Question four, Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Scottish Government what discussions ministers have had with civil servants regarding the EU withdrawal legal continuity Scotland bill since the Supreme Court's judgment on it? Minister. Uh, presiding Officer, Scottish ministers regularly discuss matters within their responsibilities with officials. In addition, the Cabinet Secretary for Government, Business and Constitution has held a meeting with representatives of the parties in the Scottish Parliament to discuss the bill and the options for proceeding with it following the Supreme Court judgment. Alexander Burnett. Uh, I thank the Minister for that answer. Um, now, the original largely unlawful bill was pushed through on emergency procedures, giving MSPs hardly any time to scrutinise important legislation compared to the EU Withdrawal Act, which had over 11 months. So can I ask the Minister, will he therefore rule out using such emergency procedures in this way again? 
Minister. Presiding officer, um, as I have indicated, the decision on how to proceed is the subject of ongoing discussions between Mr Russell and the other parties of this parliament. A meeting took place shortly before Christmas, I think Mr Tompkins was there, and a further one is due later this week, I believe. An announcement on how we proceed will self-evidently be informed by those discussions, but an announcement will be made in the coming weeks. But just to be clear, no matter how many times the Conservatives seek to claim otherwise, the Scottish Government's position on the Continuity Bill was vindicated by the Supreme Court. Yes. No ifs, no buts, yes. no maybes. Exactly. Willie Rennie. Does the Minister not think that the answer is a proper dispute resolution procedure on areas of common interest, rather than a Scottish veto or a Westminster veto? Surely the acceptance of common endeavour in areas of common interest is the way ahead. Minister. Uh, Presiding officer, uh, as I indicated earlier, this is a matter of discussion between the parties of the parliament who are each can genuinely input to the process. So I would encourage Mr Rennie to bring forward those points if he so wishes at the next meeting, which I believe takes place tomorrow. Question five, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it will ensure that EU citizens living in Scotland can maintain democratic participation. Minister. EU citizens will retain their right to vote and stand in Scottish Parliament and local government elections after Brexit. We have previously set out our intent to protect EU citizens' voting and candidacy rights in Scottish Parliament and local government elections. The programme for government includes a commitment to bring forward an electoral franchise bill which will extend the franchise to include citizens of all nationalities legally resident in Scotland. Rona Mackay. I thank the Minister for that answer. Several EU citizens in my constituency have been in touch with my office concerned about the UK Government's EU settlement scheme. Does the Minister agree with me that the system is currently not fit for purpose apart from the gross unfairness of it, as the UK Government's own settled status scheme app is only available to Android phone users and not to those using other mobile devices? Minister. Thank Rona Mackay for that supplementary. As laid out in our programme for government, for this year, we have uh, stated already committed to bring forward a franchise bill. We have opposed the settled status fee charge and we have set up our advice service working with Citizens and Advice Scotland in order to ad advise the EU citizens in our communities who make such a huge contribution in order to help them through the settled status scheme. We are doing that going over and above anything that the UK government are doing because, as was highlighted in Rona Mackay's question, there are serious misgivings around both the technical and practical delivery of the UK government's mechanisms for uh, help, uh, bringing EU citizens through the settled status scheme, but also uh, how much their uh, efforts are, are, are going in terms of reaching out into communities uh, and, and assisting those who uh, have accessibility issues or, or, or are not comfortable uh, using uh, digital technology. Therefore, our advice service will provide face-to-face uh, -face advice, telephone advice and online advice, and we hope it will make an important difference. Question six, Andy Whiteman. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the preparations being made by it and its agencies for a potential no-deal Brexit. Minister. Uh, President Officer, the Scottish Government remains committed to keeping Parliament informed of our contingency planning for the prospect of exiting the European Union without an agreement. We have repeatedly made clear that the UK Government can and should take immediate steps to exclude the possibility of a no-deal outcome. Until this happens, as a responsible Government, we will continue to intensify our preparations. This includes work at directorate level on identifying the risks and potential impacts, as well as mitigating actions across a wide range of issues. The Scottish Government Resilience Committee leads on our preparations for no-deal Deal. Officials, key agency leads, ministers, and a representative from COSLA meet each week to assess progress. Andy Whiteman. I thank the minister for that answer. He'll be aware that uh, no deal cannot be removed other than by a deal or by revoking Article 50. Given the vote last night in the UK Parliament, does the minister agree that no deal is now significantly more likely? And importantly, in this context, and following Mike Russell's statement uh, in Parliament on the 18th of December, will the Scottish Government now place in the public domain? technical notices covering devolved areas similar to the 105 notices published by the UK Government. Minister. Um, by aligning her, herself with the hardline Brexiteer wing of her party last night, the Prime Minister has brought a no-deal scenario uh, even closer, as Andy Whiteman has alluded to. It's imperative that while continuing to press the UK Government to see sense and step back from the brink, we continue to plan for the worst. It's entirely appropriate and necessary that we do so. Uh, Mr Russell addressed the issue of a no-deal uh, planning in a statement uh, a few weeks ago, uh, the Scottish Government is happy to consider how we continue to up members, 
and I will take the point that uh, Mr Whiteman has raised uh, away and discuss it with Mr Russell. Adam Tomkin. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. There is a meeting chaired by the Prime Minister in London today to discuss preparations for a no-deal Brexit. The First Ministers of Wales and Scotland were both invited to attend that meeting. As I understand it, the First Minister of Wales is there, but the First Minister of Scotland is not. Why not? Minister. Uh, I, I, I find it staggering, uh, Presiding Officer, that with the, the horrendous situation we find ourselves in around Brexit, here we have the Conservatives taking an opportunity in here simply to make a point like that. Uh, Mr Russell, as Mr Tompkins well knows from their exchanges in this chamber, is a perfectly adequate, far more than adequate representative for the Scottish Government at that meeting. Question 7, Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its discussions with the UK Government regarding Brexit. Minister. Yeah. Presiding officer, last week the First Minister and the Cabinet Secretary for Government and Business and Constitutional Relations met with the Prime Minister and the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster to discuss Brexit. The Prime Minister has said she wants to give the devolved administrations an enhanced role in the next phase of the Brexit process. However, the UK Government continues to ignore the views of the Scottish Government, the votes of this Parliament, and indeed the 62% vote of the people of Scotland to remain in the EU. With the clock ticking down to exit day, the Prime Minister must start listening to people outside the Conservative Party and DPU, uh, DUP, abandon her damaging red lines, seek an extension to Article 50 process and immediately rule out a no-deal outcome. And, President Officer, I hear Mr Tompkins chuntering from a sedentary position. Just a small point, this government is getting on with the day job alongside Brexit, unlike the UK government. Fulton McGregor. Thank the Minister for that response. Last week, the Prime Minister showed she was running scared of the verdict of the Scottish people. Isn't it the case that the mandate for an alternative path for Scotland is cast iron? A majority of MSPs and Scottish MPs returned at the last two general elections support holding an independence referendum, an option endorsed by this Parliament with the manifesto on which this Government was elected on. Does the Government agree that the people of Scotland should be in charge of their own future and not live at the whim and dictate of a hardline, inflexible, out-of-touch Tory Government? Minister. Presiding officer, as Fulton McGregor says, this Scottish Government was elected on a clear mandate that this Parliament should have the right to hold another referendum if there is a significant and material change in the circumstances that prevailed in 2014, such as Scotland being taken out of the EU against their will. This Parliament voted on the 28th of March 2017 in support of an independence referendum in light of Brexit. Brexit. It has been the consistent position of the Scottish Government that we will set out our views on the next steps for a future referendum on independence when there is clarity about the outcome of the Brexit negotiations. Sadly, as we all know, there remains no clarity over the outcome of the Brexit negotiations, even as time runs out before March 2019. But what is clear is that Brexit changes everything utterly. Question 8, Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. To ask the Scottish Government when it next plans to meet Welsh Government Ministers and what matters will be discussed. Officers, the Scottish Government routinely engages with counterparts in the Welsh Government on a range of business at both official and ministerial levels. Last week, the First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Government, Business and Constitutional Relations met with Mark Drakeford to discuss Brexit matters. On the 28th of January, the Cabinet Secretary for Government, Business and Constitutional Relations spoke to Julie James at AM concerning electoral law issues. Earlier week, this week, the Minister for Europe, Migration and International Development met with the Welsh Government Council General. And tomorrow, the Lord Advocate and I will both meet with Mr Miles ahead of the next meeting of the Ministerial Forum on EU negotiations, which takes place in Edinburgh. Lewis MacDonald. I'm grateful for that comprehensive reply. The Minister will be aware that Welsh Cabinet Ministers recently provided the National Assembly of Wales with comprehensive analysis of the devastating consequences of a no-deal Brexit for the economy and the people of Wales. Further to his reply to Mr Whiteman's question, is that an example that Scottish Ministers may be minded to follow? Minister. Uh, President Officer, we have much in common with uh, Welsh colleagues. Uh, today, in fact, I understand the Welsh Assembly is uh, uniting behind a motion uh, considering in detail the impact of uh, a no-deal Brexit, uh, indeed Brexit, and the catastrophe it would be for Wales. So we continue to share much common ground on that. Uh, with regard to the point that the member makes, as I indicated to Mr Whiteman, we are happy to take that request away and consider it. 
Um, but I, I do think it's important that we recognise as a parliament, as indeed I think most of us have, the catastrophe that a no-deal Brexit would be for Scotland. I can take a very brief question, very brief supplementary from Ms Gilruth, still within time. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what the implications of Brexit are for Scotland, which voted 62% to remain in the EU. Very briefly, Minister. Mr. Mr. Officer, the implications for Scotland of Brexit are extremely alarming, as the Government has detailed and the Parliament understands. All Brexit outcomes will be bad for Scotland, but the Prime Minister is now running down the clock to the most damaging of exits. Very briefly. And the DUP voted to reopen the withdrawal agreement and amend the Northern Irish backstop and that the EU have categorically stated that the withdrawal agreement is not open for renegotiation, does the Minister agree that pursuing the impossible is simply running down the clock and risks a no deal at the behest of Tory Brexit? Well, that's fine. Which that's would be brief a enough. No, 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 no. Minister, government. please. President Officer, I agree with uh, Ms Gilruth. Uh, last night, a majority of MPs for Scotland voted to extend Article 50, rule out no deal and to respect the overwhelming vote in Scotland to remain in the EU. The UK Government decided once again to ignore Scotland's democratic voice. The Scottish Government, however, will continue to do all we can to protect Scotland's interests and we urge the Prime Minister to extend the Article 50 process to avoid the disaster of no deal. Thank you very much. We now move on to the next set of questions in Culture, Tourism and External Affairs. Number one, Maureen Watt, please. To ask the Scottish Government what impact UK Government immigration policy is having on Scotland's working population. Minister. Migration is vital to Scotland's population growth. Each year for the next 25 years, all of Scotland's population growth is projected to come from migration. Therefore, the UK Government's commitment to cut net migration to the tens of thousands could seriously harm our economy. If implemented, Scotland's working age population is projected to decline by 4.5%, a reduction of 1, 000, uh, 150,000 people between 2016 and 2041. A Brexit-driven reduction in migration would see GDP in Scotland drop by an estimated 6.2% by 2040, equivalent to a fall of almost 6.8 billion a year in GDP and 2 billion in government revenue. This is an unacceptable price for Scotland to pay and is why we need a migration policy tailored to Scotland's needs with more powers for the Scottish Parliament. William Watt. I thank the um, Minister for that answer. An NHS Grampian survey recently presented to mm. Aberdeen mm. City Health and Social Care Partnerships states the risks not only to staffing but also medical supplies, accessing treatment, regulations and cross-border issues are high risk due to Brexit. This is compounded by this Home Office's stubborn refusal to engage with MSPs and our offices. Does the Minister agree with me that the Home Office should stop treating MSPs and members of other devolved parliaments like second-class representatives, start engaging with us to resolve urgent immigration cases as soon as possible, and is it not time that the Westminster government stopped That's using e EU nationals and others no, as pawns I, I, in their Ms. games? Watt, not, no, Ms Watt, it was a good point, but it wasn't brief enough, and I'm getting tetchy, Minister. Thank you, President Officer. Brexit could indeed have significant impacts on health and social care in Scotland with potentially serious consequences for the recruitment and retention of health and social care workers in Scotland. And, and as dear as Maureen Watt has raised, it also raises concerns in areas such as medicines, medical devices and clinical trials, access to future EU funding and the rights of Scottish citizens to access state-provided healthcare across the EU. On the point about correspondence, MSPs are understandably concerned about these issues and the impact on their constituents. I have met with the UK Immigration Minister Caroline Notes several times to highlight the Scottish Government's concerns and reiterated our willingness to work collaboratively to safeguard the interests of EU citizens in Scotland. However, despite committing to meaningful engagement, the Home Office continues to refuse to deal substantively with the concerns of Scottish Ministers and MSPs on immigration cases. This is completely unacceptable. The UK Government has repeatedly committed publicly and privately to the full involvement of the devolved administrations. By, uh, so far, unfortunately, I have been frustrated by the quality of this engagement. <laughs> Nevertheless, the government is clear that it will do all it can to support EU citizens through this difficult time. And I, as minister, uh, am happy to receive correspondence from MSPs to write minister to minister to the UK government. Uh, and I've done that for uh, MSPs across the chamber. Willie Rennie, briefly. 
Um, I have concerns about the immigration policy too, with uh, sectors like the fruit and veg farms in my constituency, the universities, the tourism industry are already being impacted by a drop in the number of workers in Scotland. I don't support the devolution of immigration policy as these problems are not unique to Scotland. What actual and practical steps has the Minister taken to influence UK government policy? Minister. Just under a year ago, we presented, Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hizop presented our substantial paper to the Scottish Parliament on how we take practical steps uh, and seek to influence UK policy. We have written repeatedly to UK government ministers about our concerns with the MAC report and the white paper. We have done that in person. We are going to be submitting to the consultation from the Migration Advisory Committee on the shortest occupation list. We are working in, uh, across every area of government that we can to influence UK government policy making and working with stakeholders across business who are deeply concerned about what's in the white paper, particularly the proposed salary threshold. But I say to Willie Rennie, and I say this in good faith, what we are proposing in terms of flexibility in the, in the UK system is, being, is taking a solution-focused approach in response to what is being proposed in the UK government's white paper. He said that in his constituency, and this is the case for many across Scotland, that key sectors are going to be affected by what is being proposed in the UK government's white paper. So I say to Willie Rennie, come and meet with me, engage with us as a government and together let's be solution focused for the benefit of your constituents and the common good of Scotland. Question two, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what it's doing to maximise the benefits of Robert Burns' legacy in the South Scotland region. Minister. The Scottish Government wants to maximise the social, cultural and economic Absolutely. benefits of Robert Burns' rich Absolutely. legacy for the whole of Scotland and through Events Scotland. We provided 30,000 to the Big Burn Supper in Dumfries as part of Scotland's winter festivals. As part of this work, we have commissioned the Centre for Robert Burns Studies at the University of Glasgow to produce a report which will help us to understand the impact of Burns on the Scottish economy and associated prospectus for driving inclusive growth. We expect the report's findings will be helpful in ensuring that the enduring legacy of Burns can help to accrue ongoing benefit for Ayrshire, Dumfries, the wider south of Scotland region and indeed the country as a whole. Colin Smith. I thank the Minister for that answer and I would highly recommend Big Burn Supper to all members which runs until um, Sunday. The Minister will be familiar with Ellisland Farm, uh, the family home built by Burns in 1788. The future of, of Ellisland is very much at the crossroads uh, and the trustees have developed proposals not only to save Ellisland but transform it as a major attraction. Can I ask that the Minister, uh, if you'll take the opportunity to find out more about the, the proposals which are an exciting plans uh, and hopefully meet with the trustees to discuss how the Scottish Government may be able to assist in delivering a viable long-term future for Ellisland Farm. Minister. Uh, thanks, Colin Smith, for that question. I understand that representatives of Ellisland uh, have recently met with Historic Environment Scotland officials to discuss the trust plans for developing Ellisland. Um, and if uh, they have not done so already, I would encourage them to continue their dialogue with Historic Environment Scotland to ensure that this vital part of Scotland's history uh, and heritage is preserved for future generations. I want to take supplementaries, but they must be brief. I've got Finlay Carson, and then I'll take Joan McAlpine. Mr Carson. As, as the presiding officer will know, the South West 300 is a stunning 300-mile drive with awesome coastline, hills, glens, forests and lochs, and abundant history, which much rivals the publicised North Coast 500. The Burns Country Run is 160 miles and dedicated showcasing the many locations associated with Burns. These routes have huge no, tourist potential. No, that's not brief. That's not brief. Get your question in. Uh, what will the Scottish Government do to quantify this potential and what support will it give to the Burns route? Minister. The Scottish Government is committed to uh, investment in tourism in the south of Scotland. For example, there's been a half million Visit Scotland uh, marketing campaign, uh, half a million of South of Scotland capital funding uh, and 2.5 million for the development of a facility in Gala Shields, uh, as well as investment in the David Livingston Centre in Blantyre. Uh, I, I thank um, Finlay Carson for raising the, the point on uh, the, the, the proposed route and would be happy to receive more details on that if he wishes to provide that in writing. Joe McAlpine. Well, the Cabinet Secretary, uh, rather the Minister, apologies, join me in welcoming the purchase of the historic Globe Inn in Dumfries, one of the bar's favourite house, houses by Professor David Thompson and his wife, Teresa Church, who own Annandale Distillery. I'm delighted to report that their investment in the historic inn is already apparent. 
during the Big Burn Supper. And can I invite the Minister and indeed the Cabinet Secretary to take the opportunity to visit again in the near future? Minister. That, uh, thank Joe McAlpin for that question and uh, indeed welcome the investment that's been made and congratulate all involved. And uh, uh, the, I would be happy to uh, receive invitation as part of our planning for the winter festivals next year and, and thank her for that offer. Question three, Adam Tompkins. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government for what reason its external affairs budget increased by 52% from 2017-18 to 2019-20. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, between 2017-18 and 2018-19, the external affairs budget increased uh, by £1.5 million to support our expanded external presence in Brussels, Canada and Paris. All of the increase of £6.7 million in the 2019-20 draft budget is due entirely to a change in the way that running costs, including staffing costs, are presented across the Scottish Government. These were previously pre uh, presented separately, but are now included within ministerial portfolios at the request of this Parliament and its Finance Committee for transparency. There is therefore no net increase in this year's 2019-20 resource available for spending for external affairs. Adam Tompkin. Uh, thank you. Uh, reserved matters are excluded from the devolved competence of the Scottish Ministers. This reservation is particularly important uh, in the case of international relations. So ruled the Supreme Court in its unanimous judgment a month ago in the Continuity Bill case. What legal advice has the Cabinet Secretary taken to ensure that this increased budget is lawful? Cabinet Secretary. The Supreme Court judgment does not affect the Scottish Government's ability or determination to prepare for EU exit or uh, continue our international work. And indeed, the UK Government and a whole variety of different agreements with us understand and support our international work. It is extremely small-minded of the Conservatives to think about limiting our ability to help our universities, our tourism sector, and indeed our trade and economic activity by saying everything has to be done within the confines of Scotland. I think it's about time that we raise our horizons, and certainly this government has done and will continue to do, and in relation to our activity. He needs to, he needs to be quite clear that the Supreme Court judgment does not affect our ability to carry out our duties and our functions as good uh, internationalists and good global citizens. Question four, Anna Sarwar. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met Airbnb and what issues were discussed. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Scottish Government officials last met Airbnb on the 29th of November 2018. The meeting discussed the regulation of short-term lets, including the Stage 2 amendment to the Planning Bill regarding short-term holiday lets. A note of the meeting redacted to remove personal details, together with notes of other meetings with Airbnb, uh, were published uh, recently in response to a request under Freedom of Information and is available on the Scottish Government website. Anna Sarwa. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Recent evidence released by the Scottish Government revealed that there were 2,200 Airbnb listings in Glasgow in July 2017, a 45% increase in the last year. Shelter Scotland have expressed a concern that short-term alerts may be exacerbating the existing housing crisis. Does the Scottish Government share this concern? What action is it taking to ensure that Glasgow's tourism industry is both sustainable and delivers for local communities? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I think the member makes a very important point. Sustainability, both for tourism, but also for the housing market, is really important. Uh, that's why, in relation to short-term lets, I know there's a debate currently happening in terms of the planning bill, and I understand in relation to housing legislation as well. The short-term letting uh, working group uh, is engaging with local authorities. I'm sure they're doing so with Glasgow, but we'll make sure that Glasgow's situation is brought to their attention and they engage in that. I understand uh, Glasgow City Council uh, regulations introduced in March 2017 um, have also had an impact. So there are current powers that authority, uh, local authorities already have, but obviously in terms of looking at the overall picture and indeed the housing market, there has to be an integrated look to this. And I think it's something that uh, all of us will take a keen interest in. Question five is large. Question six, Claire Adams. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it's doing to support Scotland's festivals in 2019-20. Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> 
Scotland is the proud home of a fusion of cultures, arts and creativity, enriching us, enriching us all with festivals and ev um, events. Uh, today, uh, I'm sure everybody would want to join uh, me in congratulating the Imaginic Festival this their 30th anniversary. Um, Visit Scotland will have invested over £3 million across 109 <coughs> cultural events and festivals this financial year, while Creative Scotland provided 485000 to 18 festivals around Scotland in 2018. The Scottish Government the Expo Fund has supported the Edinburgh festivals with over £21 million pounds since 2008 and the current applications are being considered and between uh, 2018 and 20, um, 2023, £5 million pounds through the Platform for Excellence programme is supporting strategic projects across the internationally acclaimed Edinburgh festivals as part of the Edinburgh and City uh, Regional Deal. Claire Adamson, briefly please. Thank you. Um, Donald Shaw, a leading figure of Celtic Connections, one of Scotland's foremost music festivals, recently warned that the added bureaucracy required to book UK musicians in EU member states following Brexit will put Scottish musicians at a disadvantage. He also predicted new problems for musicians coming to Scotland. Does the Scottish Government share my concern over the detrimental impact of Brexit and the Scottish music sector? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, of course, Celtic Connections uh, is a hugely international festival. It, uh, for the first time, has received £100,000 of Festivals Expo funding. Uh, it truly is international. It is welcoming to musicians. They want to come here. But the UK's immigration white paper would drive a coach and horses through our music industry uh, sector um, unless there can be changes made to ensure that there isn't a bureaucracy in terms of the visas. Uh, there is an issue about in terms of in, in terms of uh, festivals wanting to book our uh, musicians as well. Uh, we want to make sure that we remain a welcoming, inclusive country, and that uh, extends to everybody, particularly including uh, the many musicians that come. So when we have senior leading figures in our cultural sector warning of the consequences of Brexit, which would be absolutely compounded by a no deal Brexit, which was accelerated by the farce that was Westminster's activities last night, we have to take them very seriously indeed. Claire Baker, very briefly. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware of recent reports of exploitative working practices within some major festivals. Will the Cabinet Secretary commit to frank discussions with festival organisers and relevant companies to ensure that this is not tolerated within the sector? Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the, the Member makes a, a very important point. I've already done so with some festivals. I think it's important that anybody in receipt of public money uh, embraces the Fair Work agenda and I think that's a, uh, an improvement that uh, everybody in the sector would want to see happening. We just have to make sure in terms of their abilities that they actually carry out what I think is a commitment to try and address this issue. Question 7, John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to support tourism, including business tourism, between Ireland and Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Our National Tourism Agency Visit Scotland actively promotes Scotland to visitors from Ireland, our sixth largest tourism market. It undertakes a large range of marketing activities. Business tourism is one of the many reasons Irish visitors come to Scotland, with a majority coming to visit family members. Last week in Dublin, I met with business and university interests to discuss Scottish and Irish connections and collaborative working, and spoke to several tourism businesses interested in Scottish investment. Uh, can I say if it was uh, left to uh, uh, Mr Scott's colleague Adam Tompkins, none of that would be happening. Yeah. Thank, John Scott. Uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer and she will be aware that the First Minister announced at the Scottish Chamber of Commerce dinner in December that £2 million of new funding will be given over the next three years to Scottish Chambers to promote business tourism and business development through local Scottish Chambers of Commerce. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell Parliament and my constituents at the Ayrshire Chamber of Commerce when that money might be available as they are keen to further strengthen and grow already established trade and particularly tourism links with Cabinet Ireland? Secretary. I, I'm delighted that the Scottish Chambers of Commerce are, are working internally but also with the Scottish Government to encourage business tourism. Their links in terms of key sectors uh, in the collaboration would be a great advantage in attracting uh, business conferences and other activity here. In relation to spending, I would point out that we're facing a budget vote shortly and if the member is wanting us to invest in expanded investment in, in relation to chambers of commerce investment for exports or indeed any of this export area uh, helping support the budget would be one way of doing it question eight sandra white uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what analysis the Culture Secretary has carried out regarding the impact of Brexit on the arts and creative sector in Scotland. 
Cabinet Secretary. Uh, leaving the EU would have significant wide-ranging negative impacts on Scotland's culture and creative sectors, including access to funding, trade, working internationally, access to skills and talent. Those impacts have been highlighted consistently in analysis undertaken by sectoral organisations and by the Scottish Government, including a recent Ernst & Young report. This uh, built on previous analysis undertaken by Scottish public bodies in the sector. Uh, and indeed, in looking at the extension on the extent of EU funding received by cultural sector organisations, this work found that EU funding of at least £59 million was received by Scottish cultural organisations over the period 2007-16, demonstrating the significant importance of EU funding to these sectors. Sandra White, um, please. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Thank you for that answer. Um, on Saturday, Cabinet Secretary I attended Celtic Connections, an organised by Bemis, celebrating diversity and culture throughout Europe and throughout Scotland as well. Uh, your answer, obviously, in, in, implicates that uh, basically we could lose these types of uh, cultural and international events. It would, uh, the cabinet secretary agree with me that this would be a great loss if this dis disappeared both culturally and financially to Glasgow and Scotland. Briefly, uh, the Bemis uh, uh, connections uh, with uh, Celtic connections and their association has been a great success in recent years. A lot of that funding so actually comes from the Scottish Government from our Winter Festivals funding. But there are events uh, at Celtic connections which Donald Shore, the artistic director, has made clear would not have taken place had there not been collaboration in, in terms of EU funding opportunities. So therefore it does matter and we have to remain an outward looking country. We have to welcome people, uh, musicians and artists and others to uh, celebrate and what better way to celebrate than it, the wonderful Celtic Connections which has uh, appeared to go and I would encourage anybody who's not been to go and visit and take part and buy tickets and support our artists. Thank you. That concludes portfolio questions and I apologise to Willie Coffey and Mark Griffin for failing to reach them. Try though I did. Uh, we now must move on to the next item of business. I'll give uh, members a moment to take their places.